Well, the prosecutor arrests in the case of Michael Dunn. That's the man accused of killing 17-year-old Jordan Davis, who is a black teenager. Police say he was unarmed and killed over playing loud music. Now, this was a dramatic ending to the state's case this morning. Prosecutors brought out Davis's shirt, tank top, and boxers for the jury to see, with the gunshot holes clearly visible. And these shots, according to the prosecution, were premeditated. They say Dunn deliberately had to put more than six pounds of pressure on the trigger every time he fired one of the shots. But the defense brought forth their own parade of witnesses, family and friends, who claim Dunn is not a violent man. Are you aware of Mr. Dunn's reputation for peacefulness? Yes, very nice guy. Never have I observed anything other than a very calm demeanor. I've always thought he was a gentleman. Similar words are also being used to describe Davis, a young man we still know little about, right? Trayvon became a household name, Trayvon and the hoodie. Our Martin Savage is out front now with more on his story, the 17-year-old whose life was cut short. Sitting in her son's bedroom, Lucia McBath reads from a journal she started soon after 17-year-old Jordan Davis was killed. Everywhere I turn, Jordan, I see you. I keep remembering all the things we used to do and all the places we used to go. You pretty quickly realize that we are eavesdropping on a conversation between a heartbroken mother and the child she can no longer see. I need the country to know you and our God. Help me and your father to make the changes necessary to make our world a little bit safer. I don't want anyone else to die. In the shorthand of news, Davis is simply the black teen shot and killed by a white man, allegedly over loud music. That's how he died, not who he was. Yeah, he was athletic. He liked sports. He played a little baseball. Humorous, fun-loving, jokester. Um, full of a, a lot of understanding and wisdom. Due to medical issues, his parents feared they'd never have children. Then came Jordan, named for the river of biblical fame. Jordan was raised most uh, definitely on a strong spiritual foundation. Um, and I had, we had him in private Christian school um, for a few years until fourth grade. Then pulled him out and I homeschooled him from fourth grade to eighth grade. He wasn't perfect. Jordan's grades and attitude seemed to take a turn for the worse as an early teen. So he went to live with dad in Jacksonville. Some tough love turned him around. He began talking about joining the military, becoming a Marine. Mom says friends naturally followed him, and he liked that. He was always wanting to be the first, always wanting to be the leader. That is now all in the past. Back in Jordan's room, Lucia confesses to occasionally wearing his prized Air Jordans. And I know that's kind of silly, but it just kind of made me feel like he was with me, and I just kind of walked around in his shoes. The only thing she cherishes more is a photo taken on an early Christmas gift Jordan begged to have, an iPad. This was actually the night before he was murdered in his bedroom in Jacksonville with his friend Leland. This was the very last picture we have of him. This was probably Aaron the most difficult day of the trial for the family because it was the medical examiner who took the stand. You have the graphic images, you have the bloody clothes, you have this very clinical description by a doctor describing how your child dies. But the parents, it was too much. They had to leave the courtroom before they listened to all of that. It's the first time they were not in court since this trial began. Tomorrow, Michael Dunn himself may take the stand. Aaron. All right, Martin, thank you. And, and I want to bring in Trayvon Martin's family attorney, Benjamin Crump, and criminal defense attorney, Janet Johnson. And Ben, let me start with you. Um, you know, I, I'm just thinking, you know, in the Trayvon Martin case, he quickly became a first name across the country, right? The president, um, you know, said if I had a son, he would look like Trayvon. And, and yet we, and now, uh, frankly, as, as Martin said, you know, Jordan Davis gets referred to as the black teenager shot by the white man. And I'm wondering if you see parallels between these cases. I mean, part of the reason Trayvon became a household name was people like you who went out and told his story and made sure people knew about him. Um, do you think that Jordan Davis uh, should also be known like that? I think all our children should have uh, value and respect uh, because their lives matter. And remember, Aaron, at the beginning, nobody was saying Trayvon as a household name. In fact, 
it was easily going to be swept under the rug if it wasn't young people who mm -hmm. said, I could be like Trayvon. And what's so ironic is Jordan Davis took a photograph with him in a hoodie to show support for Trayvon. Mm -hmm. No way he could have imagined, you know, months later that he would be killed and his killer would say, stand your ground. And it's just so tragic on so many levels. And, and Janet, let me ask you, a lot of this case in terms of the stand your ground defense rests on this one issue, which is why uh, Michael Dunn would have shot Jordan Davis and shot so many times. And as you heard the prosecution say, every time you had to put six pounds of pressure on that trigger in order for the bullets, of which there were, uh, they were saying today, 10. How can that be self-defense? Well, that may be answered tomorrow. The defense is proposing to put on an expert in acute stress disorder. And I think that that expert might address that when you're under stress, adrenaline might take over and they might shoot more times than are necessary to what we would think. That may or may not come in tomorrow because Angela LaCorey is objecting to that witness. She's actually deposing him tonight and the judge will decide tomorrow whether that comes in. That could be a crucial piece of information that the jury is going to be asking for an answer mm -hmm. to. Why did he shoot so many times right and Ben what's your what's your take on that question because I mean do you in your mind think that there's any way that the jury here could exonerate Michael Don I mean it, it, do, it, what do you think is it possible Ben well you know we thought in Trayvon's case that it was clear-cut and we certainly think this is even more clear-cut because there are three live witnesses left uh, the troubling thing is just like the kill of Trayvon Martin the kill of Jordan Davis they put themselves in harm's way. And, you know, Trayvon Killer could have stayed in the car and drove away. Jordan Davis's killer could have stayed in the car and drove away. And that's the tragedy of it, because if you reverse these roles and you have Trayvon Killer's, uh, his killer, and you have Jordan Killer's killer, nobody would be saying whether it was first degree murder or not. And that's the most troubling thing as an officer of the court, to look at these double standards. The double standards because of race. Well, certainly nobody can deny the fact of race in these cases. Janet, let me ask you, because when it, when it comes down to what's going to happen here to Mr. Dunn, um, the defense called a character witness um, for him, his son. Uh, his son named Chris, and, and he told the jury his father was in a good mood at his wedding, which was just before the shooting. And I want to play what he said, though, when he was cross-examined, because this is something that if he is exonerated, it's going to rest upon these personal character, um, you know, these people vouching for his personal character. And here's how the exchange went. How many times had you seen your father, Michael Dunn, in the last 15 years prior to your wedding? Um, three times. Three times total? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Is it fair to say you didn't know your father very well prior yeah. to having him at your wedding? Yes, it is. So, Janet, if that's who they're going to as a character witness, yes, it's his son, but he said it's fair to say I didn't know my father very well. I'd seen him three times in 15 years. Um, is that the If that's the best they have, are you worried? Well, and his ex-wife as well, and, you know, she wasn't giving a stellar recommendation. I think that's one of the reasons Dunn has to testify, because the jury's going to think this is bad character that came out as well. What kind of dad doesn't see his son in eight years? And I think he's going to have to take the stand tomorrow and explain that, explain why he didn't tell anyone that he saw the gun. I think he is going to have to testify, which is a very difficult thing for a defense attorney to sit through, having his client on the stand. All right. Well, thanks very much to both of you. And as Martin reported, uh, if he does testify, that will likely happen tomorrow. We'll continue to cover that case. Uh, but we did want to give you a chance tonight just to get to know a little bit about Jordan Davis. Well, still to come, should the Obama administration